Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our March 1st, 2022 uh, Federation of Friends meeting. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we're excited to see you all. I wish we could be in person uh, together, but we'll take this as a close substitute. Um, thank you for taking the time to join, with, join us tonight. Um, my name is Allison Rankin. Tonight, we are conducting our Federation of Friends meeting virtually. And therefore, because this meeting is virtual, I will state the following. This is a staff-led virtual public meeting. And although we may have Board of Supervisors members or Park Authority Board members in attendance, I want to state that this is a community meeting and any elected and appointed officials will not be voting at this meeting. And with that, I want to also just note that we are recording this meeting and we will post it so that others who are unable to join us tonight have the opportunity to see this as well. And then I will pass it to uh, pass the mic to our new executive director, Jay Cole. Thanks, Allison. Um, welcome, everyone. If you can pull up the presentation with the agenda on it. Um, thank you all for being here. I think I've probably said this 15,000 times, but every time we talk about this meeting, I call it the Fellowship of Friends because of Lord of Rings. Lord of the Rings, or just feel like we're the Fellowship of Friends, but I will stick to the Federation of Friends. But if you hear me say fellowship, that's why. Um, next slide. So we're going to start off. Um, I've met a lot of you already, but <clears throat> I wanted to sort of give a little bit of um, introductions um, about us. I am going to actually flip it. I'm going to start with uh, Laura. We have are very pleased to say that we've hired our new resource management division director who is here today. And I just wanted to give her a chance to say hello, a little bit about herself, um, so you can put a name to a face but for those very few people who don't know who um, she is. So Laura. <laughs> Great, thanks Jay. And good evening. My name is Laura Grape and I'm very excited to be joining the Fairfax County Park Authority team um, and join the team of the, of the resource management uh, division. It's a great group, and I am on week three, um, day 11, day 12 now um, of, of working with the Park Authority, but um, I just wanted to take a quick moment and introduce myself. I am the former executive director with the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District, and so I have worked ex extensively with natural resources across Fairfax County, uh, supporting and working in partnership very closely with the Park Authority, as well as other uh, departments within Fairfax County government, and helping to translate a lot of those different services to residents, backyards, commercial, industrial locations as well. So I feel very uh, excited to be joining the Natural Resource Management Division and, and helping to continue the great reputation of the Park Authority and continuing to grow um, the, the work that we do in a wide variety of ways. So thank you, Jay. I pre uh, appreciate the opportunity and still learning a whole lot right now. Um, I'm an eager to come back in the future and share a lot of what we're doing with Resource Management Division. So thanks very much. I'm very excited to be here and look forward to working with you all. Thanks, Laura. Um, so for those of you who I have um, yet to have the privilege of meeting, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background about um, myself. I am also, like Laura, an ecologist by um, training. I started off, I grew up in Fairfax County. I grew up in um, Reston, Virginia, and my first job in Parks and Recreation was at the Reston Community Center. I always like to say I worked at the pool, um, which was the greatest job ever. Um, and I worked there for a few years, and then I got an entry-level um, position at uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Com Commission in Montgomery County Parks right across the river. Um, and I started as an entry-level ecologist and worked my way up there. I spent um, almost 17 years over at Montgomery County Parks. And when I um, left to come here, I was the um, chief of the park planning and stewardship division. And my division had um, all of the park planners. And so the sort of who, what, where, um, when and why of our park system, um, the planning for our CIP, the planning for our acquisitions program. I had cultural resources section, which had 117 standing historic structures and over 500 known archeology span sites. We had archeologists and five museums. Um, I had 
all of the ologists were under me. So I had all the forest ecologists, wildlife ecologists, um, stream ecologists. We had our own um, MS4 per permit. And so I managed the MS4 permit for um, the parks department. And um, I had the trails um, group, trail planners and natural surface trail implementation. So that's kind of my background. I sort of was a um, roundabout planner a little bit um, in that I had to figure out how to do planning um, because I was um, managing projects. I do environmental review of projects that were the master plan alignment. And everybody told me that the master plan alignment was just conceptual, that I was building them. So I realized I had to go back in time and really get involved in the planning process to make sure that mistakes weren't made at the beginning. So that's kind of my um, really uh, quick and dirty um, history. I'm very happy to have uh, Laura on board now because I've been struggling with not going you know, back to my old ways and dealing with ecology. So it's good to have somebody who's managing um, all of that. Um, so I can say, um, talk to uh, Laura, but anytime you wanna talk natural resources, um, as long as there's no decisions to be made, um, I'd always love to talk about fish and wetlands and stream restoration. So that's um, um, that really quickly. I just wanted to also um, um, just let everybody know that um, um, Ken Quincy, um, uh, Kyle Stone, and what is our other board members that are, and Tim Hapman are all um, here as well. Um, and thank all of the staff that are here. And I wanna especially thank Allison who put everything together. I'm saying that now because I'm gonna forget um, at the end. So uh, next slide. So here is the, um, the agenda. We're gonna go through um, a budget advocacy presentation. Um, thank you very much uh, for all my budget team for putting it together. We're gonna um, do a little bit of a recognition of Kathy Ledeck that we did at our board meeting, our last board meeting, and then we're gonna go around the room. So our portion of that will be about an hour, and then we're gonna, um, the presentation will be an hour, but with questions will be about an hour, and then we will um, go around the room. So when we get to the around the room portion, Allison will try to keep our time to make sure that everybody gets um, a chance to speak. And um, next slide. Okay, and we're off. So uh, I wanted to give a little quick start to um, a lot of my thoughts on um, parks or our thoughts on parks um, to sort of get on the same page and talk about um, sort of where we're going. Um, I really truly believe that parks are economic drivers. If you think of any world-class city on the planet, they all have world-class park recreation and cultural amenities. So if you look at Central Park in New York or Golden Gate Park in San Francisco or Millennium Park in Chicago, and the significance of great parks, especially in more urban areas, is very, very clear. Um, parks are essential to creating vibrant, economically competitive places. I'm very into placemaking. In fact, you know, parks and their amenities, um, they provide are always cited as amongst the most important factors influencing decisions by businesses about where to relocate or expand. Um, multiple academic studies have uh, shown that parks increase property values anywhere from five to 20%. Um, Well-designed and cited parks are essential to establishing a clear sense of place. Um, I'm really all about social capital and parks really do foster social capital, which is that connectedness and cohesion um, of communities and often um, act as social, um, create social hubs, especially during times of natural disaster. It's that network of relationships amongst people who live and work in a particular um, area, and it, it enables us to uh, function more effectively. Um, if you know me, you know that racial equity is a really um, huge um, priority of mine. And parks plays a pivotal role in advancing racial equity by bringing communities together and helping to break down social, racial, and cultural barriers. When you play and recreate with people that are different than you, you tend to really be able to understand um, them a little bit better. I really do uh, think that they parks improve health outcomes, especially amongst low income households. You know, people who are exposed to really green environments have the lowest levels of health inequality. Um, because parks and trails promote good health. Um, living close to parks and other recreational facilities is consistently related um, to higher physical activity levels for both um, youth and adults. So 
Um, I really think of parks as the free gym. Um, for most residents, you can take kids out to a playground or go to a trail and decide that you want to improve your health outcomes. And you can do that for free in parks. Um, but that is why, next slide. I really think that parks were one of the heroes of COVID. Um, setting aside, not setting aside, but obviously elevating um, healthcare professionals and the true heroes of COVID. Really during the pandemic, parks was the lifeline for a lot of um, residents. 83% of adults found exercising at local parks, trails and open spaces were essential to maintaining their mental and physical health during COVID-19. Um, it was so bad as we all recall that the C CDC, when they were closing down everything else, stressed the importance of staying physically active and visiting parks and green space and actually asked um, parks not to close their trails and their open spaces um, because it was that important for people's um, mental health. At FCPA, during COVID, our park attendance was up 60% from pre-pandemic. Um, our staff was super innovative and created fantastic virtual programs that over 31,000 participants took advantage of. Pool and summer camps were at capacity. Um, the summer entertainment series had record attendance. Um, golf rounds were up 50%. Um, and we even converted Audrey Moore, our rec center, to a mass making facility. So there is some good news that came out of COVID. I think that people are really appreciating parks a lot more and the value that they um, that lies therein. Next slide. So parks are an integral part of the county. And if you don't already know, one of the first things that I did when I um, got this position was I um, committed to visiting all 420 parks within the first year that I was here. Um, I'm a little bit over 219, but this is the graphic that we have. On the right, this is where my phenomenal um, GIS staff created an app for me because I don't know which way is, is where. So I have an app on my phone that I mark with the flags. When I go to a site, I take some key elements, take some pictures. So this is a map of the county with all the flags where I have been. Um, Already the dark blue are our areas of opportunity, which are our, um, our neighborhoods that with the most vulnerable populations. One of the things I'm really learning about this is that um, you, you need to, I need to see each and every park, um, but more importantly, I need to understand the neighborhood that that park lives in. So me driving around allows me to not only see the park, but also see the neighborhood. Are there are a lot of uh, multifamily households with no um, backyards. Well, you know, unprogrammed open space is gonna be really important to those populations. Are we on two acre lots? Well, maybe we're gonna value something a little bit um, different there. Next slide. This is a little bit about um, what we are and we're gonna provide you with this, this presentation. So I'm not gonna go into all of them, but this is a little bit of a snapshot of how large our park system is. We have 420 parks eight golf courses, nine rec centers. We serve a, um, a population of about 1.2 million people. Um, our total visitation is um, upwards of 18 million. Um, 177 summer performance. I just said I was gonna read them all. Um, so but this is sort of a snapshot of, of, of who we are. Next slide. Um, and our system is growing. So in the last, from 2011 to 21, so in 10 years, um, we've acquired 738 acres, um, 17 miles of trails, uh, 27 athletic courts, 22 picnic shelters, 24 playgrounds, 13 natural or historic sites. And uh, our total visitation was about two and a half million um, visits. So we are um, increasing our services, but as you're gonna hear from, from Mike, the resources aren't necessarily following suit. Next slide. Speaking of Mike, I'm going to turn it over to um, Michael Peters, who is the division director of our business um, business administration division. Did I get that right, Michael? Okay, I'm still absolutely this administration division. I just call him my money man, so I have to <laughs> think about it as to what his actual um, name is. So, Michael, 
Thank you, Jay. Yes, that's one of my many uh, nicknames. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, take a second to thank you all for uh, allowing me to come back uh, to the Federation of Friends again this year to talk about our proposed budget that's on the table, as well as uh, several key issues uh, that we think are important to communicate about our uh, funding uh, situation and about what our system looks like. But before we get into the keys of the operating uh, budget, we did want to share essentially some breaking news in terms of what uh, is happening with the capital improvement program as well. Next slide, please. You all may recall back in the calendar year 2016, FY 2017, the Park Authority uh, completed a, a needs assessment uh, looking at uh, items in our uh, entire inventory that were either critical, in need of sustainable, uh, 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 improvements or visionary improvements. And all of that together over this time period added up in that uh, uh, year at up to about $1 billion in system-wide capital needs. As you know, we've been chipping away at that through our different bond cycles over the last several years. But if you take a look at the next slide, you can see that in the county executive's proposed budget in the capital improvement program, there are some key changes that are being proposed to the uh, bond system as a whole. As you can see here, just uh, very quickly, uh, one of the issues that has been driving uh, problems with uh, getting projects completed in the capital improvement area as a whole in the county is uh, the ability to continue to be able to sell bonds uh, at an amount to be able to get our major projects completed. So a joint committee of schools and the board of supervisors, the school board and our board of supervisors has recommended that uh, there is an increase in the annual bond sale over overall from $120 million to $170 million per year. This uh, would assume uh, from our uh, work on this that the cash flow for the Park Authority would be up to $20 to $25 million annually. However, this also becomes now a six-year referendum cycle rather than a four-year cycle. And if you recall, our four-year bonds have been at the $100 million level. And at this point, our six-year bonds would be at uh, also the $100 million level. So even if we have cash flow that is approved to go up to 20 to $25 million, $100 million divided by four is a lot different than $100 million divided by six. We do have some very specific big needs that are in the works. It's important to note that uh, Patriot Park North is well underway with our new Diamond facility. That's $20 million. Uh, Mount Vernon Rec Center, we'll be talking more about that in a variety of different venues over the uh, coming uh, weeks. We have Lee District Rec Center improvements in the offing, Audrey Moore, Sully Woodlands. We have several things that are in the offing showing that our current cash flow projections for bonds would show us is spent by about FY 2027. It's about $170 million that we have focused on all of these different projects there. Uh, so you'll see a little bit more about this as we go forward, but we wanted to set the stage here so you can understand some of the dueling uh, issues that we're facing as we're looking at this proposed budget. Next slide, please. The impact here is essentially, again, that we would not have a bond until 2026. Uh, and this could very much result in having insufficient funding to improve our rec centers or maintain our facilities and limited funding for several very key issues uh, or key areas where uh, we're always uh, seeing what the needs are throughout our entire park system. Hard choices will have to be made for our CIP implementation based on this new, pro, uh, new process. Uh, and one of the things that we'll be talking about is how really we need to be able to focus on the restoration of a bond cycle that at least keeps us at the $25 million level and gives us the increased ability to spend uh, bond dollars when we have some of these higher level projects that are uh, in the uh, schedule. Next slide, please. So here we'll go into the operating budgets. And as we talk through this, we're going to give uh, an overview of how uh, the county is funded, how we're funded both from our uh, fee-based or our pay-to-play activities, as well as from the general fund. So first, let's go to the next slide for the big picture of how the county is funded. And here, 
<clears throat> certainly we're talking a lot about this right now uh, from the political standpoint, as uh, all of us who live in Fairfax County, we just received our assessments and people saw those assessments go up. Uh, the uh, budget is based primarily, more than two thirds of it, on that real estate tax. And this year, a penny in that real estate tax or a penny uh, for every $100 of value equals uh, about $28 million, keeping in mind that that $28 million is really split just about evenly between the schools and the county. Certainly, there's also additional revenue uh, that comes from personal property tax and the commercial tax. But uh, for these purposes, uh, we're going to be talking about this penny and that $28 million as we go forward. Next slide, please. So this visual shows that in the current uh, adopted budget this year, FY 2022, uh, the general fund budget is uh, just over $4.5 billion. And what we need to uh, really note here is that more than half of that, of course, comes right off the top to go over to schools. So what we're really focused on is everything on the right side of this pie, where you can see some of the big items like health and welfare at $505 million dollars, public safety at $549 million. And if you go all the way around towards the bottom, you can see there's libraries at $30,588,934 and parks at 27 million or almost $28 million. Uh, those are generally grouped together in the general fund proposed budget books. And it's important to note that yes, libraries is funded at a higher level than parks, but we're also fundamentally different. Uh, Jay just talked a few minutes ago about the phenomenal growth that we've seen in our system uh, and keeping in mind that we have 420 parks over 24,000 acres. Uh, when we talk about libraries, there are 23 locations, just for comparison, about a half a million people in the county have library cards. There are about 1.2 million per, uh, in-person visits. Uh, they have about 390 FTE positions, and their personnel budget is about $26 million versus about $6 million on the general fund side for uh, parks. So that's just to set the stage because we're often asked, how do we compare to libraries, sort of our closest cousin in uh, this whole funding uh, pie. Next slide, please. We have several different buckets that fund the park authority. Uh, today, as we're going forward here, we'll be talking about the two largest buckets and primarily focused on that general fund bucket because it's that and the park revenue fund which form the basis of our operating funds. How we turn the lights on, how we open the doors, how we pay uh, our staff in uh, natural resources, how we're able to come in and get the work done. We have these four other, uh, I say fall, smaller funding buckets, and you would probably say to me, boy, that park bond construction bucket of $170 million is big, and it is, but when you look at these, what these different buckets are, they're very programmed, mostly focused on capital improvements or specific programs where we are applying for funding. So first, there's the park improvement fund. That's the fund which actually is, uh, is uh, nurtured by the park authority. This is uh, uh, from our telecom uh, revenues as well as any excesses over the past several years in the park revenue fund. And that's really to reinvest uh, back in the maintenance needs of our facilities. The bond construction fund, that's where, of course, uh, we uh, uh, operate our much larger construction projects and capital improvements. Then we have our general construction and contributions fund, this is really focused on non-revenue facility projects. This is where we have our ADA compliance, uh, athletic field maintenance and equipment, turf uh, maintenance, uh, uh, our sinking funds that also help uh, to a certain degree with uh, our maintenance needs, as well as environmental improvements and grounds maintenance. And then finally, you see that environmental and energy program. That's where we uh, receive funding for specific projects that we uh, apply for in uh, the uh, counties uh, focus on zero waste and on improving uh, the environmental outlook for the future. So let's go to the next uh, slide and uh, we'll talk a little bit about our park authority uh, uh, fund sources. First, we have the revenue fund. And as you can see here, 
the right side of the smaller pie, that's the $39.6 million in our FY22 operating budget, that is entirely supported by fees. You can see that we have greens fees and rentals, memberships and passes to our uh, rec centers, as well as our different programs. Uh, in the other category, there are also boat rentals and a variety of other uh, uh, items that are supported, again, through fees. Those are increasingly important to the Park Authority as they're really our only tool to expand programming and other activities. So on the flip side of that, let's take a look at the next slide, which shows the other side of the pie, that almost $28 million, the general fund, that really focuses on everything else that we do or the maintenance of our park system overall, our non-revenue uh, producing areas. So you can see, that of that $28 million, we have about 34% of that goes to our general maintenance, about 6% towards our rec pack program, planning and development, you can see our cultural resources at 3%, uh, natural resources at 18%, our lakefronts in the MLK pool, and then administration. Now that's the pie for all of the uh, general fund. And I do want to keep in mind that again, from those buckets, we do have a little bit more that comes to us, like for instance, uh, one of uh, our most successful programs is the uh, IMA program working on invasive management. That is an annual program that the county funds at $300,000. Uh, we also really focus in that natural resources pie there, uh, which is again, just a small portion of the general fund. We focus on the four pillars and then inventory and planning of our flora and fauna, certainly protecting our natural capital, restoring and managing our natural assets through programs like helping our land heal. And as we just talked about our invasive management area program. So there's a lot that goes into that pie. When you go to the next slide and you see how it all comes together, uh, it looks like the pay to play or the fee based activities are the big Pac-Man eating the rest of it. So you see that all of that that we just talked about in the general fund is the smaller portion of this pie. And as we focus on our dual priorities of making a more equitable and accessible park system and expanding on our core mission focused on conservation and environmental stewardship, increasingly we have to focus in this fee based area. And one of the questions that often comes up is if we have a, uh, our whole funding pie like this, what do our vacancy rates look like? So we wanted to take just a second on the next slide to uh, give you a sense of uh, how uh, personnel is funded in the county. We talked a little bit about libraries and their personnel budget just a little while ago. So on our general fund side, uh, we have 356 authorized uh, general fund merit positions. The uh, total cost, if we had every single position employed, uh, it's about $25 million. However, our salary budget is about $23 million. So in the county, we have positions that are authorized and then a personnel budget, and the two aren't um, necessarily joined at the hip, so to speak. So we do try to focus when we have new programs and new initiatives that we appropriately categorize what the personnel expenditures are going to be. Uh, but in general, we have to make sure that we can cover all of our needs out of what that budget allocation is. Our vacancy rate, our, our target on the general fund side is about generally 9%, and that's about 32 positions. Right now, we actually have 91 positions that are vacant, uh, and uh, we are working through uh, uh, several different recruitment efforts. About uh, half of those uh, are in various stages of active recruitment, uh, and we're continuing to look at uh, what we can do to make sure that we're staying within that budget as well. So that brings us to the next slide. This is just a quick overview uh, of our proposed uh, budget, the general fund side of things. And just to show uh, you uh, on the one side there, you can see how we ended FY 2021 uh, with expenditures of about a little over $26 million. This year's budget is uh, like I keep saying, it's a penny uh, in the real estate tax rate or about $28 million. And the FY23 advertised budget uh, raises that a bit more to about $30 million. And there are some key items uh, that went into this. Uh, there are, and you've 
sure you've heard of the, about this uh, in the uh, news coverage and also uh, listening to the Board of Supervisors. There are uh, compensation increases. Uh, there's a 4.01% market rate adjustment. The last time there was a market rate adjustment at this level was 2007. There are performance increases. Uh, there are also um, mechanisms to make sure that our retirement system is fully and appropriately funded. Uh, and uh, there are some other living wage adjustments in here as well. Now, there are some additional programs uh, that uh, the county executive is proposing uh, to fund in his base budget, which leads us to the next slide. In working with the Park Authority Board, we're in a unique situation in that we work very closely with the board uh, before the budget process really kicks off. So back in September, uh, we worked with the board to identify what the revenue fund proposed budget would look like, and also to identify what those key general fund budget requests would be that the board wanted us to really focus on. And you can see that's that left column there, uh, about $7.9 million we asked for. Uh, that includes an equitable access program to attempt to uh, really uh, make all of our facilities uh, available to people regardless of whether or not they can afford to pay our fees. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Patriot Park North, uh, and we have requested that uh, the county on the general fund side uh, both fund the operating costs and the capital costs uh, that are remaining related to that, as this is part of Supervisor Herity's Sports Tourism Pack, uh, uh, Task Force. In addition, uh, we've highlighted uh, the need to be able to add additional maintenance uh, dollars every time we have land acquisitions. Uh, because there are additional utility costs, maintenance costs, tree maintenance costs. Uh, and uh, we asked for $201,000 to cover the last 165 acres uh, we brought online in the last uh, uh, four years. Natural resources sustainability. Uh, this is really a comprehensive look at how and what uh, needs to be done across the board to maintain the 4,000 plus acres that are actively managed by our natural resources uh, branch, which we talked about just a moment ago. Uh, and then we also had about a million dollars in requests through the Environmental Improvement Program. As you can see, what was included? The county executive included in his proposed budget a half a million dollars as a pilot program to begin to open up our equitable access initiatives. And just to keep in the back of your mind, the county already provides $100,000 for this. And we in the Park Authority on the revenue side uh, allocate approximately one to $1.2 million per year in scholarships. So this is an opportunity to begin looking at how we might be able to expand that. Uh, but again, almost whatever we do has to be thought of on uh, that uh, revenue or that pay to play side of things. Patriot Park North uh, was funded, uh, although this is uh, just a partial year because we are uh, opening two of the fields in uh, most likely at the end of summer. And then at the end of this calendar year, uh, beginning of the next calendar year, we will fully open the park. And that's when our maintenance uh, workers will be on site to support this facility. We were lucky enough uh, to uh, make our case and to focus on that maintenance impact. So that's fully funded in the proposed budget. Uh, we did uh, receive a nod towards our natural resources sustainability uh, programs by uh, having another $50,000 in the proposed budget added to the IMA program. And then uh, on the environmental impact program, you can see that we did receive quite a bit of funding uh, there. And this is focused specifically on some different initiatives like our Watch the Green Grow initiative, uh, which is a mapping application for county residents to record environmentally friendly packages practices in their own yards. Uh, we received three years worth of funding for water chestnut control, uh, which is uh, helping us to uh, control this invasive floating level plant. We are going to be um, adding uh, additional bottle filling stations instead of uh, water fountains at several of our parks and facilities. And we're also able to focus on the uh, Annandale Urban Park, which will include a civic plaza, uh, multifunctional and flexible lawn space, educational garden, and other um, environmentally focused uh, aspects to it.
So we can celebrate uh, that certainly there has been in some investment here. Uh, however, as you'll start to see what we're talking about here in just a second, most of the investment on the general fund side has essentially stayed relatively flat over the last several years. Next slide, please. This just shows uh, here uh, in uh, just the simplest way that we could identify what has the general fund investment looked like in the park authority uh, from FY 2011 to the current fiscal year, FY 2022. None of these dollars have been adjusted uh, for inflation. So these are uh, actual real dollars in the time in which they were appropriated. So you can see that over this time period, uh, our overall general fund investment has increased by about $6 million or 27%. While that line up on the top shows the portion of the general fund that the county has to invest after uh, the uh, first initial um, uh, split uh, of every dollar that comes in with schools, that has actually risen over $460 million or 39%. So the question is, what's really fueled this uh, in different ways? As we were looking at all of this, uh, we uh, could really identify that the main driver has not been the addition of a lot of new programs or uh, support across this entire growing park system. But if you look at the next slide, it shows that essentially if you take out our baseline salary adjustments, then it's relatively flat over this time period. We have uh, increased overall by about $6.1 million, like we talked about, uh, but of that, um, it's uh, really $5.3 million devoted specifically to salary increases. So you can see here that any sort of adjustment that we've seen over the years has really been in the top bar there or the revenue fund, the pay to play portion. Uh, and uh, you can see a bit of the impact. These are our budgets, but certainly uh, in FY20 and 21 and beginning here in FY22, uh, that was a bit lower uh, simply because we had to close facilities and we were reducing capacity. Uh, but we are looking at, um, because of the uh, recent uh, VDH uh, and uh, CDC guidance, we'll continue to open uh, that capacity, but the growth you'll see will be in that green bar. So next slide. This is really uh, how uh, much we've seen of the uh, increase over the last 11 years. So again, six point, almost $2 million. Of that, $5.3 million has been uh, allocated to uh, market rate adjustments and other salary increases for staff we have. Uh, you can see that there are a few programs that have been added on the general fund side. We were uh, able to uh, have $150,000 added into the base for our resident curator program. Our internal drive cam program uh, has been funded. Uh, capital equipment uh, baseline of $200,000 an increase in rec pack hours, restroom cleaning, uh, that $100,000 I talked about earlier on equitable access, but we do wanna point out that this miscellaneous cost line of $111,000 uh, is uh, really uh, a uh, combination of things like increased fuel costs, uh, IT service costs, telecommunications costs, and things like that. So you can see, again, that the big portion of the Pac-Man, if you will, is staff salaries, not much uh, in terms of moving the needle on our program side. And then to drive this home uh, just a little bit further on the next slide, uh, we've drawn things back even a little bit further there. Uh, the county's general fund support for the Park Authority really remained fairly consistent through the late 80s to the late 90s, as you can see up here. Um, in FY90, uh, 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 our portion of the county's general fund budget was about 1.2%. It spiked a little bit in 1.3% uh, in uh, 1991, uh, but it's remained relatively stagnant since then. And the reason that we expanded this back to 1990, and uh, you'll see in just a moment, uh, even before that, is because in 88, uh, FCPA built four new rec centers thus increasing the revenue fund and the ability to grow revenue with new facilities and programs. The county absolutely supported the development of these four rec centers through the bond process. However, the county also mandated that all operational expenses be covered by fees and charges since rec center operations are going to be sustained by those fees. That's really the model that 
uh, really launched into the system where we are now. And you can see uh, in the current fiscal year that our percentage of the general fund is about 0.6%. So to put that a little bit differently in the next slide, uh, you can see uh, here the value of a penny. Again, we keep talking about, about a penny. And in 2022, uh, right now, a penny in the real estate tax rate is worth about $28 million. In 1988, uh, that penny was worth about $5 million. And in uh, 2011, it was uh, worth about $18.7 million. So this is a way that we can really compare that investment uh, in a, a visual way that really drives it home. In 1988, uh, the general fund investment in the Park Authority was 2.6 cents of every uh, uh, dollar in the uh, real, estate, real estate tax rate. 2011, that went down to 1.6 cents. And then in 2022, where we are right now, it's at a penny. And that's really what we're focusing on. We have a funding model uh, that uh, uh, really we're looking at trying to increase accessibility, increase our conservation and environmental education efforts. Uh, but we're at a point where our only option is really to be able to do that uh, from uh, fees, uh, which is in direct contradiction to what uh, really we're trying to do, the goals of the county and the goals of One Fairfax. So with the next slide, I'd like to be able to uh, turn this back over to Jay, who's going to introduce a couple of our Park Authority board members who will speak uh, further. Thank you, um, Michael. I, um, I call him my money man because he's probably the only person who can make sense of all that and be able to um, explain it to you in a way that, um, well, let's be honest, explain it to me in a way that I understand. Um, so thank you so much for, um, for uh, that. I uh, want to turn it over um, now to a couple of our um, Park Authority board uh, members, um, Kyle Stone um, first, who um, shares a background with a lot of us. Um, sustainability is is his game, and um, we're so happy to have somebody on the, well, more than one person, but um, somebody on the board who has um, some background in uh, natural resources and sustainability. And I am going to um, um, call him the Honorable uh, Bill Bowie, just because it's fun. Um, and how many, how often do you get to be called the Honorable uh, Bill Bowie? So I'm going to start off with um, uh, Kyle Stone. So Kyle, welcome. Next slide. Thanks, Jay and Mike. Thank you too. Great presentation. Uh, I think I'll be quick, particularly on this slide. This just another way of showing you what what Michael showed you several times. Our current model is very tilted in the direction of revenue support. And that also very much directs hamstrings the park authority in how we or, or what programs get supported. I mean, we're very driven to pay attention to uh, programs that generate revenue. So we're talking our golf programs, our rec centers, things we can charge for. And what gets left behind, much to you know, my chagrin, and I know the consternation of my fellow board members, are things that you know we really other things we care about in the park system. You know, our natural resource areas um, in some of our neighborhood parks, and it also makes you know, particularly recently, it has always been an issue, but particularly recently, it's been an issue for the county of making sure there's equity across across programs, and that's a very hard thing to do when our focus so much has to be on sustaining our operations through fees and charges. Um, this is not a new reality. This has been trending this way for, for quite some time. If people paid close attention to that graph Mike showed where the kind of percentage of rev general fund revenue support dripped the last time it was 2009. And in 2009, I was then supervisor of Cook's office in the Braddock district and that was the last time there was a big hit to um, the county's revenue and Park Authority was one of the people on the chop, one of the groups on the chopping block then, and the county's never really um, come back and filled, filled that. And so we've just been stuck at that low level since 2009. Um, and unless something changes, uh, the way we do business is only gonna become harder. So we can go to the next slide and we can start talking about some ways perhaps you all can help us out there. Um, the board members, they expect to hear from us, and to a large extent, they expect to hear from you, but it's, it is very good for you to get in front of them. 
in any case. And one thing I will point out, the second to last bullet there that mobilize others, um, that's, that's really critical. If board members don't hear the kind of messages from multiple people multiple times, um, they can kind of just chalk it off as you're a friends group who's disappointed that their one park didn't get what they wanted, but you really need to make them understand this is a system-wide issue. Um, and the more people who can convey that message, the better. Um, and now that we're in the actual budget cycle, there's a great opportunity for you to do that. And you go to the next slide. And there's, this is the kind of most in your face way that would be getting, going to the public hearings. Um, having sat behind board members on a number of very long nights listening to public testimony, what I would suggest to you if you do decide to go out there uh, and testify, and I hope you do, I think it's probably the most impactful is when someone is actually there in front of, um, in front of the board members on those nights, is stick to one, maybe two key things. Um, when you get it, three minutes goes by very, very quickly. When you get in there trying to talk about uh, everything under the sun, um, everything gets lost. Keep your message pointed uh, and keep, it, keep your focus narrow. Um, the other nice thing is if everyone does stick to one or two points, they hear the same thing over and over again, and it starts to be something that sticks with them. One thing I will say just generally about the budget cycle is once the county executive releases his budget, within a small margin of error, it's more or less set. They're not going to make any wholesale changes. That 65-35 ratio we've got of general fund revenue support is not going to change because of people's comments this budget cycle. That is a longer term issue that we will need you to be kind of maintaining your vigilance on, you know, through this budget cycle and beyond. But what you can, where you can be helpful in this very kind of narrow window of time is assisting us in some of those requests that we made that were not funded. So that, you know, nearly $800,000 of natural resource money that only was 50 grand. Um, that's a thing that the board members can adjust um, in the parameters that they have left to them this, you know, within between now and when they actually vote on the budget. The, the, I think Michael covered that, or maybe very briefly, I'm not sure, but one of the other things that's hitting the park system this, uh, this cycle is on the revenue fund, uh, salary increases dictated by the board of supervisors are not funded by them. So that's a million and a half ish, I think if I got the number right, kind of hit to our revenue fund line, unless somebody comes up and supports that. That is another item. It's a very specific tangible item and it's a dollar amount that is low enough where if enough people got on that one, could be another item uh, where we could actually see some movement there. So those would be the two items that I would suggest you focus on. I understand there might be things, you know, you're all friends of, um, and I understand there might be things very important to your particular park, but I think uh, in this budget cycle, we, not, we need to think about the system as a whole and what's important for the system, not maybe uh, what's most important to our specific park. I think I'm done. Thank you, Kyle. I think that one of the hardest, um, that was great. I think one of the hardest things for people to understand, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like being an accountant and people who don't do taxes. I know Ken volunteers to do um, taxes in his spare time. Um, Ken Quincy um, assume that accountants only work during April. And the answer is think of the budget like accountants. I, we're already working on next year's budget now to try to make cases for next year's budget. So um, um, keep that um, in mind. And I will turn it over to the Honorable Bill Bowie. Thank you for uh, being here tonight. Well, thank you, Jay, for having me. Um, and, and first of all, I want to thank everybody, uh, all of the all of the friends groups. Um, we've we've talked about some of the significant uh, financial gaps that we've got in this whole thing, and uh, those gaps would be even wider without uh, the support of all of the friends groups and and the volunteers. Uh, I can't say enough. Um, Kyle also didn't tell you that he's the new chairman of the um, resource management um, charge of the Park Authority. So his committee will be looking at a, a lot of the things that you do um, and uh, certainly looking forward to his leadership 
and the expertise that he brings to, to um, the Park Authority Board. Um, we, like you, we are all volunteers. Um, and so uh, thank all of the Park Authority Board members for their service as well. When we talk about the general fund, um, the, the fee-based model that we've got today doesn't really create an equitable and accessible park system. Um, if you look at the demographics of the county and the way that they've changed uh, the percentage of growth in the county, the diversification of that growth in the county uh, means that the park system has to change as well. The, uh, the Board uh, of Supervisors adopted uh, the One Fairfax Initiative in um, 2016. And uh, so we have included One Fairfax uh, as one of the, the great elements that we use in our decision-making process. And as the Board of Supervisors and many of uh, you that I've spoken with, um, know very well that I say, you know, equity costs money. And so, you know, we are in the middle of revisioning what that park authority looks like when you layer on top of that uh, racial equity in parks, because all parks aren't the same, but they, they should probably come to. Um, our general support, general fund support has certainly decreased over the past 10 years. Kyle went through that where, you know, we're, we're less than a penny now. We're 0.6% of, uh, of the overall budget. That's 0.6% of 1%, uh, which is, you know, that's, that's really significant in that uh, we're not able to meet the needs uh, of a park system with now over 24,000 acres, 420 parks serving over a million residents with 18 million visits uh, a year. And if one thing was shown during the entire uh, pandemic period and continues today, is that parks were just a vital, vital element of bringing the community together and providing relief for people to get outside and get a breath of fresh air or throw a Frisbee or play a pickup game or just sit in a park and enjoy nature. Um, and so uh, we value our parks when we look at, you know, the stats from Visit Fairfax on why people live in Fairfax County. Parks is very much right on top of those things that those considerations. Parks and schools are two of the top considerations that we've got. So all is good there. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is our executive director's uh, definition of equity in parks. It says, where race and income does not predict the quantity and quality of parks in a specific area and rec centers are affordable for all residents. Um, the map here that we've got shows the areas of opportunity and vulnerability in the Fairfax County where our most vulnerable residents live. And that's in the areas of the blue. So you can see that there are some significant pockets uh, within the county and uh, in certain magisterial districts. And what we need to do is we need to try it as best we can to uh, spread that opportunity across the board and fill those gaps in service areas uh, of opportunity and throughout the entire park system. We need to provide better parks, bigger parks to serve all of the residents. However, in order to do this, we need funding and a CIP model that's gonna allow us to fully embrace and prioritize the principles of One Fairfax and not to be so reliant on the revenue model where we have to charge more fees. And that's, that's really the position that we're in today. Uh, we have been advocating for a lot of years that with just one more penny, that we could really, really begin to address the needs of the community as it relates to parks. Next. 
So here's some, uh, here's some facts to, that uh, I wanted to share with you in terms of our bond program. So the current budget proposal is now uh, proposing to change the bond cycle from four years until six years. And what that means for us is where we had originally had over a hundred million dollar bond scheduled in 2024, that bond is now proposed to move out until 2026. Um, the uh, same six year cycle is gonna call for a million, hundred million dollar bond. And what that really does is it impacts our capital improvement program because even if we get a hundred million dollar bond, we have a governor on us. Uh, basically, we're only allowed to spend $25 million a year. And with a billion dollars of park and recreation needs, we really, really need to work closely with the county to communicate the impact of this change. There is there's just such a wide, wide gap in what we're doing. And so we need, we, you know, we, we are constantly working on this and we need at the very least $150 million bond every four years to address the maintenance backlog, to reinvest in our rec centers, to build new rec centers and other, uh, other aging facilities in order to create a more equitable park system. Um, so, you know, I know a number of you have heard this story before, but the change in the bond cycle really, really makes this uh, more critical than ever this year. We certainly need your support uh, and your buy-in um, to what we're trying to do. We're trying, we're trying to make sure that we continue to provide the best park system in the country and that it's something that all of us can be very, very proud of. We, we have a love of our parks, we have a passion for our parks, and uh, we wanna see it continue and get better for everyone um, within the community. So again, um, thank you for everything that you do. Um, we're certainly here to uh, entertain um, any questions that you may have. The, here's the, uh, the budget, the, the timeline, we're in March. So last Tuesday, a week ago uh, today, the, uh, the advertised tax rate and the Board of Supervisors uh, uh, produced their budget from the county executive. The public hearings will start in April and uh, certainly feel free to, if you can't sign up to uh, provide a live testimony, then certainly feel free to write letters to the editor and, uh, and certainly submit your written comments into the Board of Supervisors. They're gonna wanna hear from you. Later in April, the Board of Supervisors will take all of that uh, communication, all of that testimony, uh, and they'll do a, a proposed budget with a markup. Uh, they'll uh, look at that for a, two or three weeks, and then they will approve that at their second meeting, I think it is in May. So uh, we really don't have a big window here um, for advocating, but anything that you can do uh, would certainly be appreciated and again, thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. So Any we have time for a couple, oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, um, we have time for a couple questions and then we can get into the round table and then do more questions at the um, at the end. Before we do that, and I see Kathy's hand up, um, I just wanted to say um, thank you and staff wanna say thank you to um, Carolyn Gamble for, who wrote a, um, um, I don't know if it's an op-ed or an opinion piece in the in the Washington Post. I just wanted to let you know that that staff saw it, staff read it, staff appreciate it. Thank you so much for um, doing that. If you haven't read it, please uh, um, uh, check that out. Uh, Kathy, you're muted. Sorry, I have Kathy. to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I just can't get to that button fast enough sometimes. Um, well, thank you so very much for the presentation today. My apologies for being slightly tardy. Um, I just have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, if you don't mind, um, you know, we've advocated over the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years or so uh, on behalf of the park budget, trying to get uh, 
the Board of Supervisors to increase funding. And we've done it a lot of different ways. We've done it collectively as a group. We've done it individually in budget testimony. And I, ha I have to be honest to tell you, nobody's paying attention to us and nothing's happening. That budget has really remained the same. And over the years, you know, inflation and you know, increases on the cost of contracts, et cetera, has sort of whittled away at what we really have to spend on that budget. Um, what can we do differently to be supportive of the work that you are trying to accomplish here? Uh, I think we're all concerned about the budget, but what we've done in the past hasn't worked. So what can we do differently so that people start paying attention to us? Uh, it, it's kind of a quandary. We can go provide budget testimony and I'm happy to do that. And I know many present on the call would be happy to do that, but nobody's paying attention to us. What should we be doing differently? I'm very interested in hearing anybody's input to that, but especially Ms. Cole, because you're new to the system, perhaps you can provide us with some insights from experiences that you've had elsewhere. I'd be very interested in that. Um, I can't tell you differently because I wasn't here the first time, so I didn't, um, I didn't necessarily um, experience it. I will tell you what was successful um, across the river is, um, you know, I call, I, and I can say this because I'm an ecologist as well, I call you all the greens. So if you ever hear me say the greens, you are all greens. Um, hi. Um, so the greens um, really make themselves very um, loud and heard. Um, across the river, uh, I always say the the queen of the greens, I won't tell you who she is, but she knows I call her the queen of the greens, um, can pretty much walk into our county executive's office at any point in time and ask for whatever it is that she wants because they show up um, and they vote and they get people um, elected. So I, I think that, you know, trying to make the case not just for specific programs, but that parks in general needs to be valued um, is, is one of those um, one of the most important things. I, I'm curious is if Kyle or um, Bill, who went through it, has some suggestions for um, what to do differently. Because I really can't. I don't. I, I was. I didn't experience it the first time. So I don't know if Kyle or Bill had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I think we really, really need to keep up the pressure on uh, the board of supervisors. We need to communicate with them as often as possible. Not only a, not only at budget time but just to let them know what's, what's critically important. I think that the whole um, uh, emphasis around one Fairfax um, kind of changes the game. It changes the game a lot because again, equity costs money. It, it requires that we make an investment, a serious investment in parks. Uh, and especially in those areas that, uh, that are vulnerable. So I think we need to do that. The third thing is, is that there are monies available. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, did provide uh, a ton of funding from the federal government. Um, in this current budget proposal, there's about $85 million that's not spoken for. Uh, it would be great to advocate um, on our behalf to get a significant piece of that to um, for our uh, our capital investment fund for our CRP for our CIP program, uh, and, and that's and and that's I won't call it free money, but it's money that would offset anything that we would have to absorb or or generate out of the revenue fund. Um, the hard thing that we that we as a board and Kyle back me up on this. The, the, the discussion that we don't want to have at the Park Authority Board is the consideration of closing down facilities or charging additional facilities or um, curtailing services, which is, uh, which is certainly not in anybody's best interest, but, you know, there's only so far as you can go. Kyle? I certainly don't want to have that conversation, but I am... Not fearful, but I, I do think it's probably one we need to think seriously about moving forward because I think we're very much getting to that point. Kathy, to answer your question, what I think needs to be different and where I think the park advocates are different from the school advocates is volume. Um, I don't know how many people are on this call, 40-ish, probably what, 25 and 30 of you are, are park actual friends of. Um, I have a feeling if this was a school-related call, um, 
to be orders of magnitude different. And I just can't undersell how much the numbers uh, end up mattering. And that's why I pointed out that one bullet point in particular on the, one of the slides I was going through was engaging others outside, people who you know who use the park system, but maybe you're not part of your friends group. It's those everyday users that really need to become activated. And I think you all can be very helpful in that regard. Thanks. Um, I want to, Jennifer, I think, I think that your hand went up before. Um, um, did, but... Hi. So this may have already happened. I don't know, because we're a little bit new. We're friends of uh, Eleanor C. Lawrence Park. But in terms of coordinated activity with the Federation of Friends and Advocacy, have there been coordinated campaigns, like really advertising campaigns, public service campaigns, you know, one more penny types of campaigns? Um, I was just thinking as you were talking, it's a shame that there are 420 parks because that's also uh, a weed number. So if we had 421 parks, we can find a park somewhere or close one down and get 419. We could have a whole takeover the parks day on 421 instead of 420, right? So there's a lot of different interesting campaigns we could, or we could have, hey, if you smoked weed in the park yesterday, why don't you give some money to the park? I mean, I'm kidding, but there are, have there been, I'm in advertising, have there been advertising or public service campaigns or things like that in a coordinated effort to get this point across to the public, to those people who have the 1.8 million visits or whatever, um, as well as to the Board of Supervisors to put the pressure on them so the public will be activated and put the pressure on them, um, as well as partnering with the schools or with the library. If you have a library card, maybe you should have to have a park card, you know, is there, or is there book clubs we can hold uh, hold a book club in the park that's activating uh, library people who go to the library who are probably very often the same people who go to the park. Um, so just kind of trying to think outside the box here for some different ideas in terms of bringing that pressure instead of just talking, talking, you know, like what's what's the activation, what's the public service announcement, what's the, the call to action. So maybe it's been done, I don't know, but just bringing it up. I, I, I have not seen it. I've not seen it done since '09 when I became involved with the county, and we park authority staff on the call can't be involved with anything like that, right? So there, we do have to be very, we have to be somewhat careful about how we would approach something like that, and who who's involved and who's not. Um, county staff, uh, park authority staff is ultimately county employees. They can't advocate in that kind of a way. Um, that's part of the reason why some of the park board members are here to to do some more of the advocacy type language. Um, so it would have to be done outside of Park, park Authority staff. Um, but it, at least as far along as I've been around, I've not seen any kind of coordinated campaign done by park advocates. No, I've been around on, longer than I have. Yeah, and on the marketing and branding side, you know, we, we've, we've thrown it around forever, but if we could really get a program of advocacy, advocacy around a penny for parks, a dedicated right. penny for parks yep. um, with, you know, as much as we can and just have everybody just hammering that message home, a penny for parks that would go, that would go a long way. We were certainly hoping that um, Fairfax County was gonna, gonna um, pass the uh, meals tax because the meals tax would have provided a significant relief for us. Of course, that didn't pass. Um, and so we've got some other things to do. So yeah, we would love for for you or somebody to work with us and, and advocate for a dedicated penny for parks, just like stormwater management. All right, and just one quick thing. To, to organize a campaign like that, penny for parks and get that going um, in terms of the whole Federation of Friends, I think that's easily done. I'm sure my own ECLP friends are would be kicking me under the table right now because we have plenty to do in our own park. But I think it all it all comes around, goes around, of course. But to just uh, get consistent messaging, get the tools people need, hand those tools out to everybody so they're consistent. There's brand consistency, messaging consistency, hand it out to every one of the groups in the Federation of Friends, and then they easily have the tools and it's a consistent message. You have to keep hammering that message home. Everybody has to have the same message to your earlier point, you know, one or two, well, let's do one, you know, let's do penny for parks, um, you know, something like that. So I would be interested in helping with that. And, uh, you know, if anyone wants to join that uh, committee. 
Well, we will we will certainly get with you and coordinate some messaging around that and, and get you all the information that you need. I think, I think if I could just jump in on one more, I understand Bobby Longworth is on the call and not to put her on the spot, but she runs the Park Authority Foundation. Um, that would be a, um, Jennifer, that would be someone that you might wanna think about reaching out. That would be a, an ideal person to be working with on this. I, I know her well. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. I'm not feeling great, so I'm not on video. However, I feel good about this conversation. It's making, it's a very uh, welcome. And I have here on my note advocacy campaign. Uh, the foundation board can help with that. We provide website. We can do a lot of those things. Uh, and so it might be a singular place where we can, uh, we can help in that way. So yes, let's, uh, let's get that going. And we remain here to help with the Friends Group Capacity Building Fund grants, processing donations for the Park Authority Board's Mastenbrook matching grants, and also administering legacy circle gifts through their wills or other estate plans. So in addition to that, the one thing that we have not fully explored is advocacy. So this is a very exciting conversation and we are here with you. Bill, this is Harry. We have done this before when we were, when I was on the board. We, we went around and we formed the green teams and, and the green teams spoke at meetings, um, took people out on walks, did all sorts of things to help raise money and to promote the idea of the bond. There's nothing unique about our need here. We can do it pretty easily. Well, the, the, the need, Harry, thanks for, thanks for chiming in. The need is for, we do that, we form the green teams around bond programs. So we form green teams every four years. What we haven't done is we haven't had a green, a consistent green team on an annual basis to continue pressing, pressing that message. So I think that's, that's, that's the difference. I mean, we only do this, we only do this now when the bond comes up. Um, and so uh, this is a, certainly a great opportunity to do that because if we're not gonna get a bond in um, 2024, uh, that's gonna have a disastrous effect on programs and, and just things that we do. I mean, everything that we do. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're gonna certainly need help around that messaging as well. And what we're currently trying to do is we're putting together packets for all of the board members on the park authority to take to the board of supervisors and say, okay, if we don't get a bond, here's what you're not going to get over the next seven to 10 years. Things that you thought you were going to have a ribbon cutting for, those things are not going to happen. And, and as a result of that, some things may close. So, I mean, those that's the wrong. message. Those people are all politicians and any opportunity they get to get their picture taken in the newspaper or whatever, they'll go for it. So if you tell them they're not going to get their picture taken, oh my. Well, and yeah, and, and, and potentially talk about something like, you know, admissions fees at lakefront parks and things like that. And then, and then let them handle it from there. You know, right you, you know what, you know what the result is. I want to get to Toddy as the last question, then I want to make sure we go to the round table, but after we're done, we'll come back to questions. If you have some thoughts um, um, that you want to ask, we will stay on after the round table and answer um, more questions and we'll get to some of the ones in the in the chat. So am I pronouncing your name correctly, Toddy? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Thank you. I had some thoughts I wanted to pass along under um, three headings, and I'm just going to kind of go down the list because I know we're short for time, but I want to talk about short term things we might be able to do long term things and advocacy short term. Um, Bill Bowie has already hit on one. There's a lot of money that's been injected into the system for COVID, and I don't think we should be asking it. I think we should be assuming that it's coming and demanding it. Um, I've already been to my board of supervisor. Uh, along with Carolyn Gamble. And one of the things I asked him point blank was, how much COVID money is the park system getting? Now, I'm not asking them um, if they're going to give it. 
The park system has played a tremendous role in providing relief because of COVID. There's no reason COVID monies shouldn't be going to support and rebuild the parks. So that's the first thing I would do. How much money is the park system, how much the COVID money is the park system getting? Second, uh, the Board of Supervisors recently passed a litter tax. That's the tax on plastic bags that, that is now being collected. As I have read in the paper, uh, the Board of Supervisors has not decided what this tax will go towards. It makes sense to me that it should go towards supporting our parks, uh, areas that uh, are natural and that we hope to keep litter free. Uh, so anyways, I, I don't know a lot about the litter tax, I'll admit that, but it just really caught my attention that evidently the Board of Supervisors has not yet decided where this tax money that is being raised uh, uh, will be spent. So those are the two short-term things for asking for money now. Uh, get the COVID money, uh, advocate for giving the letter tax to parks. Second thing, long-term. As Kathy indicated, arguments have been made for years and they haven't promoted a lot, a lot of change, if any. And I think that suggests a structural problem. You know, if you look at the statutes that set up the park authority, it's very clear to me anyways, that it's designed to alleviate any burden on taxpayers for paying for their parks. It's designed so that most of the money to pay for parks is generated by the parks. As I read the, the statutes, and I'm not, a, I'm not a Virginia attorney, I'm not a park authority attorney, uh, I'm just someone reading the statutes. Park authority bonds must be paid, must be paid with monies raised through park facilities and fees. It can't be paid through any other monies. And you just, there are other provisions in there that just, you, you can pick up the vibe that taxpayers of Virginia do not want to be on the hook uh, for paying for our parks if this vehicle, this statutory vehicle for running our parks is adopted. It was adopted 70 years ago. It's a long time ago. You think about what the nation and our county was like 70 years ago, and it's not the, the place we know today. So, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to study this system and to see what about it still makes sense. Maybe it makes perfect sense. I'll be the first to admit that. I haven't looked at other alternatives. I don't know. It may be the, the, the gold standard for Fairfax County and the one we wanna keep. It may be one that we wanna make adjustments to. It may be one that we want to, uh, to throw out and start over. I don't know. But I think it's worth looking into. I think it's worth asking our Board of Supervisors to study this. We haven't gotten changed through other means. Again, I, I suggest that that may be because there's a structural problem with the bureaucracy, the, the entity, the structure that we have governing, park authority, uh, governing how our parks are run in Fairfax County. So I would ask the Board of Supervisors to study, to seriously study, how our parks are funded uh, and the way in which they are administered. And is this the system we wanna keep using or do we wanna make some adjustments? The, uh, and that's also important too, I, I'll note here, I think I have sensed both, uh, I, I'm just picking up vibes that we may be reaching some kind of critical point here in terms of how that system runs with the rec centers. As I said, all the, in many ways, the funding is dependent on monies generated by rec centers. And I just am hearing that rec centers are becoming so expensive to rehabilitate and build that instead of becoming revenue generators, they're going to be revenue liabilities. That is highly, highly problematic in a system where they're paying the way. You know, our natural parks, you know, uh, the squirrels and trees aren't paying any money. It's the rec centers that fund it. And so that's another problem too that, that causes me to think that we should be looking at the system and how it works. Uh, so that's the long-term thing. Study the system. Maybe, it, you know, it may be the one we want. We may not want to make any changes. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that, but let's look at it. 
Finally, advocacy. What kinds of subjects can we hit? I heard one indication of, you know, that school boards are doing it better. What do the school boards use? Kids. Everybody wants to be in support of children. They are the future. No doubt about it. They're important. I definitely put schools towards the top of our budget list. But the Park Authority also, our parks provide a lot of benefit to kids. 18 million visits. How many of those were kids? The friends group should get out into the parks and start counting kids. How many kids are in programs? How many kids are strolling through the parks? Um, you know, it's very important. The Park Authority is another part of our educational system for kids. I heard it, uh, recently that even the rec centers, one of the reasons they were built was uh, as a means to supply schools with access to pools. So I would argue that parks are an extension of the education system to, to kids. Not all learning is by books. And they can learn a lot out in the parks. And as we've heard, and as we know, as a result of this pandemic, it really facilitates their mental health uh, and enables them uh, to learn in school. They're, they're, you know, th th there's a symbiotic relationship there. So let's start counting kids. And that's something friends groups can do, be out in the parks counting kids. Volume, that was another comment. Schools have volume. Lots of people advocating for schools. We can do that too. While we're counting the kids, let's count everyone. And let's get out there with a postcard and a means by which people can identify who their supervisor is. And they can write a comment on the back of the card that says, I went to this park today. I love my parks because. And then we can, we can help them identify who their supervisor is, address the card, and get it sent in uh, to the supervisor so that these supervisors realize how many people are going to the parks and what they think of the parks, what the parks mean to these people in their own words. So those are the ideas that I have to submit before the group. Um, again, short term, demand COVID money, check into the layer tax, long-term study our system, see if we maybe can improve it. Um, and finally, advocacy, promote the parks as an extension of the education system, count the kids and help people get their comments to the parks. We know they're out there. We know they love their parks. Let's get that communicated to uh, their supervisors. Thanks. Thank, thank you certainly thank you. for those comments. There's, there's one thing I wanted to, um, I see in the comments, one of the questions asked was, was um, the increase in staffing costs. What, what is our FTE um, today versus what we were 15 years ago? We're down how many positions? When you we, compare we've almost that. Double, we've almost doubled the size of the system, but how many full-time positions are we down? Uh, Mr. Bowie, when you compare uh, us to 15 years ago, uh, we are down, um, you know, really more than about 10%. Uh, we've had some ups and some downs. Uh, FY10, there was uh, quite a, a few positions that were uh, taken. It was 25 in one year uh, due to budget reductions. And uh, we've seen ourselves start to creep back up, getting close to uh, where we were maybe 10 years ago. But 15 years ago, we're down quite a bit. Uh, and keeping in mind uh, that uh, we have to hold 32 positions vacant just on the general fund side, uh, simply to make our budget, we have some uh, built-in uh, requirements that don't allow us to uh, even get to full full uh, employment. Thank you. So, so Susan, in answer to your question, we're down approaching a hundred positions from ten years from fifteen years ago that we have not been able to fill. Thank you. Okay, I will say that, you know, the middle management staff is not coming from, the, one thing I will say coming from another agency is we, there are 12 um, division directors um, and each division director had about six, five or six uh, assistant um, division uh, directors. I, I don't know how the people on this call and ever, all the people who are working here are doing what they're doing with so little. I think I equate the staff um, here to a, um, uh, a grandmother with 12 grandkids and she feeds all 12 grandkids with a potato and a piece of bacon. Um, that is our staff who've been able to get four gold medals with um, the resources that they have. I think that's probably the thing that's amazed me the most coming over from 
um, from Montgomery County. Um, all right, so we'll, we want to get to um, um, around the, the the horn. I want to make sure everybody um, can get to their uh, piece. Is there a presentation that we pull up now, Allison? There we go. Oh, no, we're not. See, this is why I need to be managed. Thank you so much for um, nicely telling me that that's not the next thing on the agenda. Um, who is this uh, beautiful young lady on this? Oh, right, Kathy uh, Ledeck, who, who has agreed not to move um, earlier, right? That's the agreement um, in general. So, um, Bill. Oh, do we have the resolution up? I, I have the, re I, yeah, I've got okay. a copy of the resolution, but um, Kathy, we, uh, we presented this to Kathy at our board meeting um, on February the 23rd and um, didn't even begin to thank her for her contributions and the amount of service that she's provided to uh, everyone here in Fairfax County. So we wanted to make sure that, uh, that uh, everyone knew uh, of the resolution and the contributions um, that Kathy has made. So she certainly, she's been a winner of our uh, Sally Ormsby uh, Environmental Stewardship Award uh, because of her advocacy for the Park Authority. She's been the Friends of Huntley Meadows, the president of the Huntley Meadows Park, Friends Group Forever. Uh, and I can't tell you the countless, countless number of projects that uh, Kathy has been involved in and advocated for. So we certainly wanted to make sure that we on behalf of the Park Authority and behalf of all of the residents of Fairfax County, uh, certainly applaud Kathy and her efforts and hope she does not move. Uh, so maybe we can continue advocating for Kathy um, staying here. So Kathy, thank you very, very much for, for all of your services. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um... Where are we now, Allison? Next slide. There we go. Um, so James Waller, Friends of Coven Run Mill. Wow, just like that, up on top. Okay, well, next slide, please. This has been very interesting for me. Uh, I am uh, new in my position as president of the Friends of Coven Run Mill, but learning out about the budget is always important. I do like the Fellowship of Friends, better, better than Federation of Friends. And I will attest that I'm marking my two year anniversary of walking the Long, Long Branch Park to keep my mental health in shape twice a week, six miles. Thank you, Fairfax County Park Authority for keeping me sane. Anyway, for at the Friends of Colbert on Mill, it has not been a lost year. Um, in, in May, there was the inauguration of a new water wheel and flume put together by Ben Hassett, one of the last millwrights in the United States, putting together these, these mechanisms using tools of the past and replicating how this was built over the, in, in, in 1810 using white oak, which is very resistant to water. Also, thanks again to the uh, Fairfax County Park Authority and particularly Cindy Walsh, a shout out to her, I think she's on this call, for having a new permanent site manager hired. We went for about two years with uh, temporary managers, which were excellent, but it's always good to have someone in place that has a long-term vested interest. And, and Julie Gurney, who's come to us from uh, Riverbend, has quickly hired new staff so that programming has picked up rather substantially just in the few months she's been there. Also, two rooms in the Miller House now have been fully refurbished, one in 1810 style, one in 1890 that the friends helped with, and those should be open sometime this spring. And finally, last, last and far from least, Santa came back to the mill this year. We had over 300 people, young and old, enjoying the festivities. So not a last year at all. Next slide, please. Next, uh, the next year, of course, presents some challenges and of course, opportunities. Um, Colvin Run is known for uh, its history uh, uh, and also its very fascinating technology, the highest tech in place in 1810. But also Fairfax County Park Authority classifies it as a resource-based park. That means paying attention and interpreting not only the historical and technological aspects, but also the natural aspects. And as the Miller's rooms have opened up, it, 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 it opens up the, the, the connection between who lived in the house and their surroundings. So we at the Friends are putting additional uh, 
attention to the to the uh, the formal garden that is on the south side of the uh, of the of the Miller's house, and this is a project we hope to have in, in train this year. Also, we're paying attention to the tunnel that's being built by the Virginia Department of Transportation under Route 7. I'm sure that some of you experienced the delays in, 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 in on Route 7. Well, this tunnel will connect the northern side of the park to the southern side of the park, which is actually larger than the northern side where the mill and the Miller's house and the general store are located. And this will open up new possibilities to not only look at the natural resources there, but also some of the historical uh, aspects where there's an old uh, dam and, and, and mill race. So we're hoping that somehow, some way, the park authority can find resources to connect that exit from the south part of the tunnel to existing trails, the Rails the River Trail to, to Lake Fairfax and also the Cross County uh, Trail. Uh, Julie hopes to make the Colvin Run a gathering place where people want to come and hang out. And so we're very much uh, paying attention to new ideas and programming. And also as all friends group, uh, you know, we're trying to promote getting more volunteers and members because as the work expands, so uh, we need more hands. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I have taken full note about your interest in the budget. And I am speaker number 13 on April 13th at the Board of Supervisors budget hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Hi. Amy. Hi, I'm um, Amy Martin, and um, I am, and I'm, I'm not showing up, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm the brand new president of Green Spring. I'm following through um, Ivy Sinek, Sinek, who uh, brought us through um, the whole pandemic issue with Green Spring. All of our money is raised through public events and appeals. so not having the um, the uh, events, the plant sales that we normally have was a, a handicap. Last year, we started out with the fall family festival instead of the fall plant sale as COVID waned and it was very, very successful. Can you move me to the next slide, please? Okay, Green Spring Gardens is, is kind of like Colvin Mill Run in some ways in that it is very important from both a historical and a natural point of view. We have um, registered collections of plants that are of great educational um, value to the community, the, the horticulture community, as well as to people. We have a number of activities that do outreach and education with the public. We have a historic house that the Friends has been um, essential to keeping uh, furbished and um, repaired. And we, we run master gardener programs, a farmer's market and garden plots. Frogs is supporting um, Green Spring Gardens with all of the plant material that goes into these, these gardens. There's, there's not a penny that comes from the park commission or the county. We support interns and a plant shop manager. The plant shop helps raise some of these money. We support all of the community programs that um, that are run by frogs. We support Title I school visits. Uh, we match grants. We have annual projects like um, the uh, tree fund. And this year we, we are doing to replace a lot of the plants that between the lack of staffing and the terrible um, weather conditions we've had to replace. And we have a number of volunteers who work in the park. Next slide, please. To do this, um, we have over the last almost 30 years raised almost $25 million. Um, we count on our members. We have um, coming up on 1,500 members. Um, the amount decreased over the, the pandemic, um, but we're hoping to get them back up again. The plant shop generates re revenue. We have a spring garden day and the fall family festival, which is also a plant sale. We have a silent auction that um, people donate individual gifts and, and a great business support from the community. And we have an annual appeal. Um, this year with the annual appeal, we raised more money than we ever had before. And we really do think that we have a tremendous, at least local community support. What you've convinced me of here is that we need to somehow get all of these people who are supporting us to um, 
bang on the doors of the county supervisors and go ahead and support some of these changes that have been mentioned. I, I especially appreciated Tommy's um, analysis of the issues and we'll have to bring that up to our, 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 our uh, friends board. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Toddy again with the Friends of Historic Huntley. Yes, uh, Historic Huntley is a historic site just north of Huntley Meadows Park, just by a couple blocks. In fact, you can walk from Huntley Meadows Park up to Historic Huntley. And one of the projects that we have taken on, next slide please, is to um, bring back the terraces of Historic Huntley. We're very fortunate that the original terracing in the front of the property survives. You can see it here in the photo. And uh, it's, it's been a challenge to deal with because they're, uh, they're vulnerable to destruction by any number of means. Uh, one we are very concerned about is heavy lawn equipment. So for a while, a long while, it was, uh, the ground was fallow uh, and we had really tall grasses growing up and that caused other problems because lots of things wanted to grow there that shouldn't be growing there. So um, we've been working with the Park Authority and a shout out to Casey Patrici. Uh, I believe he's on, on, online with us tonight uh, as a park staff member there. He uh, worked very diligently to get the terraces uh, hand trimmed on a monthly basis this past year. And we're very grateful for that. So the terraces are looking better than they have in a long time, but they need work. They need to be uh, seeded with grass. Uh, we need to get rid of some of the woodies. We need to fix things like damage done by woodchucks, that sort of thing. And we, you know, generally our membership uh, consists of people who are interested in architecture and history. Um, we do have a good overlap also of members with Huntley Meadows Park. Uh, and what we're looking for, what, what we are a little lean on is experience uh, of this type, working with terraces, working with the, um, uh, the grounds. And so I wanted to just make a pitch to any of the friends groups out there who might have expertise in this kind of thing, or if you just want to volunteer and help us, I know we'll be getting out there this spring to put more seed on the, more grass seed on the terraces. We would love, we would love to have your assistance in, in any way you might want to contribute. Uh, next slide, please. We'd also like to invite all of you to a Plein Air event that we will be hosting Saturday, April 30th. We have about a dozen artists coming on site early in the morning to uh, paint for the day at Historic Huntley. And we are inviting members of the public to come by at 1 p.m. They can see the artists in action. We also will have um, folks on hands, uh, members of our group and Park Authority staff giving tours of the site. Uh, and this is at no charge. So this is a good time to come visit the site. If you've been wondering about the house on the hill, uh, come to our Plein Air event on Saturday, April 30th, uh, and uh, check out Historic Huntley. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Susan Lamy from the Laurel Hill Park Volunteer Team. Uh, good evening, everyone. You can show the next slide, please. So we don't have any uh, formal structure or rec center or house on the hill in Laurel Hill. Um, we just have a lot of green space that needs tending with a lot of invasive plants. And uh, last year we had over 500 hours of team time logged in trying to mostly do away with those uh, invasive plants along with doing some um, trash pickup and other beautification kind of projects. We did add uh, two native plant pollinators gardens, um, one at um, the equestrian center and one at the central green. Um, they've been quite successful in attracting pollinators, insects and birds particularly, and has, to the extent that they have fallen under the uh, notice of one of the country's longest running uh, naturalist surveys run by Jim Wagner. We're happy to see that we've gotten that notice. We participated in uh, NOVA's celebration of trees with the planting of 
uh, just a few trees that added to the county's reforestation project, which we also assisted with the prepping, planting, and, and the fence installation to protect the new seedlings from deer predation. And we've begun work on the restoration of a 1930s era forgotten garden of some significance and of, of mysterious beginnings. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. So this is the garden, one of the gardens. You can see we have uh, a pollinator visiting at the top of the pole in the center, a, a native Eastern bluebird. Next slide. And this is um, a shot of the county's project that we help with for reforestation. There's over 3000 trees of um, three different major species that were added. Uh, you can see just faintly in the background, little tiny um, pink specks. Each of those flags marks uh, part of the tree installation. The ones in the foreground were ones that were outside of the, the deer fencing. So we've, we've been quite um, successful in, in having uh, a variety of volunteers come along. We've had over a hundred people cycle in and out. Uh, we don't have the same kind of permanent ongoing team that some of your groups enjoy, but we have managed to uh, keep a sort of a subgroup going and, uh, and the courts and high schools have provided a lot of people who are looking for community service. So this has uh, helped us give some attention to Laurel Hill Park. Thank you. All right, that's the last group that sent in slides ahead of time, um, but we're certainly interested to hear from more groups if folks would like to raise their hand or share in the chat. Let's see, Jennifer. Hi, uh, sorry we didn't get our slides in, um, but really wanted to invite everyone to take a look at our website and also the Fairfax County Park Foundation and of course Park Authority site to check out Sully Woodland Stewardship Education Center, which has been one of our primary concerns over the last couple of years. So we're a pretty new friends group, uh, very, very small. I'm so impressed when I hear everything you guys have done, $25 million and all that. We're, we're nowhere near there and we're just getting started but it's inspiring. Um, but we have been working to help raise money for the Sully Woodland Stewardship Education Center, which is going to be a living building. So it'll be one of only two living building challenge buildings in Virginia, which means it will be pretty much off the grid by 110% producing its own energy and all these things. After a year when it meets all of the requirements, uh, it will be certified a living building challenge building. It's gonna be great for our park, great for our neighborhood community, Fairfax County and Virginia. Um, and we're super excited about it. The groundbreaking, which Jay was at, was uh, just, I guess, last, last month. Um, so it'll probably be ready by next year. We'll hopefully be having a grand opening ceremony. Um, the friends also got to finally have a, a in-person event, Parktoberfest. Everyone is invited, mark your calendar. This year it's October 8th. We had a band, we had a beer truck, we had um, vendors. It was really just a wonderful, nice, probably about, I don't know, 500 people came through. They put their blankets down, listened to music, um, had a great time. We had a park, we had a Parkimon we invented, which was a virtual event during COVID. So we had our college sort of youth core come out. We, if you've heard of Pokemon, which I'm sure you have, they had to capture Parkimon. We created characters and put them around in the woods. Um, they had to capture them on their camera and then they could come and spin a wheel and win a prize and have a lot of fun doing that. Um, we've had a lot of campfires where it's just s'mores and naturalists will take, take the kids on a walk. Um, we're having a Mother's Day event, May 7th. It's gonna be uh, wine, music, kids activities. Um, we're not gonna have an Earth Day event. We're gonna focus on Parktoberfest and Sully Woodlands, but this is sort of a love your mother, Mother Earth and Mother's Day event. Um, we've procured some grants um, to help ECLP out getting trail cameras, trying to, find, trying to uh, fulfill our shopping list for Sully Woodland Stewardship Education Center and Park Foundation has of course done a stellar job taking care of uh, so much to make this vision a reality. Um, 
We have a store with merchandise. We're going to have some art classes. We had yoga in the park. So we're doing the best we can, but uh, I'm going to go cry now when I see things like $25 million being raised, <laughs> but, but that's okay because that's a goal for the next 30 years. So anyway, we hope you'll come out and uh, see the progress on the woodlands and join us for Parktoberfest and, and any other events. So thank you. Great to could, see all you guys. Could I just correct that's not... 25, it's 2.5. All right, 2.5. Either way. Yeah, well, I, if only. Very, very impressive for a group that has started with four people in, in the last year. So uh, well done. That's a goal. Hashtag goals. Oh, and I'm looking forward to working on in, the advocacy campaign. So I, I think we can do a lot with the advocacy campaign with an organized message, messaging, uh, a, a strategy, a communication strategy, uh, ways to get things out there um, and just pound that message home in a coordinated fashion. So be happy to work on that. Thank you. I think I see some bartering um, happening because um, Jennifer's a, a whiz at branding and they're, they're such a, a new group but they have probably some of the best brands um, in general, I walked in, I'm like, whoa. Um, so I think that you, I think if, if I were you, everybody else, I would just barter her for some of your historic you know, knowledge into running the the um, friends of group to get her to you know give up a little bit of her um, brain power for uh, for branding cash. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, great, we're we're learning a lot. So anyway, hey Jay, while while we have a while we have a chance, I'd also like to introduce uh, Ken Quincy, uh, one of our board members on the phone and vice chair for many many years. Ken. Any insight? Ken, you're muted. I'm not now. Okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. No, I just uh, want to uh, emphasize the importance of friends group and volunteers. There's a tremendous dollar value to it, but it goes way beyond dollars. And it's uh, with as was said before, uh, without friends, groups, and volunteers, uh, you probably wouldn't have a park authority. Uh, we're just uh, very grateful for that. I think some excellent points have been made uh, concerning the importance of parks. Uh, and if, if nothing good came out of COVID, one thing probably did, and that was the uh, importance of the uh, advertising, so to speak, of the importance of parks. Because they it really went right to the top as far as the importance of uh, to physical and mental health and community health. And uh, I think that was in our favor. That's probably about the only thing that came out of COVID that was good, but uh, that, was, uh, that was one. And just one last uh, comment uh, uh, with regard to uh, the county's consideration of development proposals. Uh, I've sat in on several, including, and participated on several, including Tyson's. And uh, without a doubt, no exception, among the top four needs voiced by the public, parks was one of them. Ed education was first, no, no surprise there, and public safety. But after that, it's sort of a duel between transportation and parks. So we're, we're right up there as far as what the community needs. And, uh, and that's all communities. And talking about that in the vein of our equity uh, push, which is very important. We need to have, in some cases, larger parks, but probably more important, the location of parks. So that communities are communities are served on an equitable basis. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Ken. I really appreciate that. We've got one other person with her hand up. Sarah yes. Lennon from the Royal Lake Friends Group is patiently waiting. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Um, yeah, this has been so, this is the, I think the first Federation uh, of Friends meeting that I've set in on. Usually it's my, my co-chair of the Friends of Royal Lake group, um, Paul Gross, and I've got so many notes and I'm so excited about this advocacy and call to action 
Um, so I, I look forward to connecting with lots of people who have been um, talking and I've got a lot of good ideas. Um, but just a couple of things, Friends of Royal Lake um, or the Royal Lake uh, PVT, um, we're an informal group. We're still pretty small. We're, we're looking at trying to increase our numbers. Um, we, we are not an official group, so we don't fundraise, which challenges us, but we have a very close link to the uh, Kings Park West Civic Association because, well, I'm the president of our civic association, so we have a nice partnership there. Um, and that's how we fund a lot of the projects that we do in association in partnership with the park authority. And um, I know we've met with Kyle and a number of times and, and um, a lot of uh, Julie, on, on, who I know is on the call is, is a great partner helping us advertise our activities. Um, and one of the big things that we're doing this spring and we're, we're working on it right now is um, we're, we're gonna put out a new survey uh, to all the folks who use uh, the Royal Lake parks, um, the circuit trail, the different activities around the park. Um, and we're gonna create a new um, revised community vision plan. We did one four years ago and looking at, you know, what, what do people want from the park at Royal Lake um, and what can, how can we work to achieve those? And so, like I said, a lot of the ideas that people have talked about here tonight um, are definitely going into my my roster of uh, of ideas. Um, so I we're excited because we said four years ago we're going to do this every four years, and we have a really good team working to create this new survey, so we know what people want. Um, one thing that we do um, with the, around Royal Lake is every you know quarterly we have work days to repair the trails. So. Um, Jay, when you were talking about that, you know, you've worked with trails and trail planning and stream restoration. Those are all the things that we're doing around Royal Lake. So um, I've, I've got it on my list that hopefully we can invite you to come speak at one of our upcoming meetings. Um, and the, uh, the equity issue that you raised, I think is just um, so important. Um, so I'm really excited to hear that. And I hope we will be able to work with your schedule to get you to one of our meetings. Um, and one of the other things that I'm really excited about is, um, we have a quarterly newsletter and we have a new um, editor who happens to be a high school student um, who really is looking into trying to market and brand uh, Friends of Royal Lake. So I, I look forward to learning from some of the other French groups about how you've done that marketing and branding. And, you know, we have a Facebook page um, for Friends of Royal Lake, but looking to get onto Instagram and, and really just kind of get out there. Um, and I love the, the Parkamon um a concept so i really <laughs> so and the the parktoberfest um that was just mentioned so i'm hoping that we can get some of the younger folks um in the community engaged um so just thank you for for all these great ideas um and um if there's any way that we can be helpful like i said the advocacy i'm 100 percent in on and i'm in the process of writing my quarterly letter for our or not quarterly um, our community newsletter. And I was struggling to figure out what to write. And after this meeting, I am absolutely certain I know what to write about. So um, you guys have all inspired me. Um, so thank you. And I look forward to working with more of you in the future. So thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And I know Kevin's got his hand up. So I'm gonna um, let him uh, talk uh, next. I'd be happy to come out and um, talk to your group. I um, um, my first rule is show up, so I will pretty much show up anywhere I, I can that will help anybody else. Um, I was here for, I think, two weeks. I even met all of the staff that were there, and I was at a, a non-invasive uh, dig on um, National Lands Day, and Susan reminded me of, she just turned and looked at me and said, talk and work. I'm, I'm literally trying to meet people for the, that work with me for the first time. She just looked at me, deadpan. You can talk and, and dig at the same time. Yes, I can. Yes, I can yeah. dig at the same time. Um, so, um, um, who did I just say? Kevin. Who had his, Kevin, Kevin. Kevin. I'm with the, I'm the president of the Friends of Hidden Oaks Nature Center. And our focus last year and this year has been the building of the center. Um, the, the center was built in 1969. We celebrated our 50th anniversary with a big party Two, three years ago in 2019. So last year, the actual construction started in October of last year and will finish in June of this year. 
Um, right now, the building for is completely closed always. I mean, we're closed across, across the parks, but the staff almost can't even get in right now because they literally are tearing everything to pieces. Um, we have been working with literally the, the friends have raised funds and made donations and purchases of furniture and literally carried the furniture into the site because the new office area needs, needs to be set up properly and we're donating furniture towards that end. Um, the grand reopening at this moment is planned for July 16th and we're involved with the staff and getting plans to have a really grand reopening. Um, and in the meantime, we continue to support the Eagle Scout projects that are, that are in the park. We funded four last year and there's heavy scout support, heavy scout programming in the site. And of course, Nature Place is funded by us. And along with this grand reopening, we have collected memorial funds to establish a reading corner in memory of an Ellie Doyle winner, Jean Lobb, who passed away a year ago. And we're looking forward to that because it's gonna be a great memory for her. Finally, we are reaching out to the Andale Greenway Project, which is a plan to have a walking path, which literally will connect Green Springs to Hidden Oaks. That's in the beginning stages. So I can't say a real hot, lot more than just that. So despite the fact that we're closed, we're still like a duck. We're, we're paddling away anyway. So thank you very much for this time. Thank you so much, um, Kevin. I don't see any other hands up. So I um, I know it's two minutes, a couple minutes till nine, but I wanted to, um, as promised, if anybody had any other uh, pressing budget questions or questions in general, I wanted to um, give some time um, at the end. I know we rushed to, to end it so we'd hear from um, all of you. So does anybody have any other questions for us? Okay, so um, I think Allison, please correct me if I'm wrong. Am I closing, closing up now? Is that yep. what I'm doing? Indeed. Okay. So I wanted, to, I wanted to um, uh, say uh, sort of to you all um, what I said. I believe individually, um, in general, people have asked me a lot of times what's the difference between um, Montgomery County and Fairfax County, and I will say that I am both. Um, I am humbled and. Um, amazed and so appreciative of all of the work that all of you guys do and volunteer for our park system. I'm also a little frightened um, by the fact that we have a board full of volunteers and that so much stuff happens in our park system due to the volunteerism of all of our friends groups um, to the point where if you all decided that you're just tired and just want to go on a cruise or um, uh, hang out with your loved ones for a little bit of time, um, I am in so much trouble. Um, I can't even imagine. So my goal um, is to, and this is crazy, that my goal is to just get to the point where we as a park system can match your efforts, um, not take over your efforts, but if we could just get to the point where we're matching all of the efforts that you do every day, I think, I mean, I can't even imagine what um, all of our sites in our park system would look like. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. I know that um, this is a labor of love for you all, and I appreciate you taking time from your families um, and jobs to um, do this work and that you guys really appreciate our park system as much as 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 you do. So I just wanted to um, say that and uh, thank you so much. As always, if you have any other questions, you can um, shoot them over to me or Allison, who's um, somewhat sort of your liaison. And I really appreciate your time and attention um, tonight. This was really great. I love seeing everybody's faces. Um, so this was uh, phenomenal. So thank you so much. And thanks to um, staff who put this together, um, Allison and Mike and Sarah and Amy and everybody else on the call and all of your, your um, uh, people who run the centers for you, you know, everybody's on the call and um, we really appreciate everything. So have a great night and we're ending right at nine, which I'm amazed, um, amazed at. So thank you all so much. Good night, thank you. Hi. Thank you. Good night, everyone.